Hello and welcome to the December edition of Malapophis Hours. This webinar is taking on pet obesity with the Biggie Body Condition Scale. In the next few minutes, we will have a tech talk on the quantitative body condition methods about to shatter the current qualitative system with our special guest speaker, Dr. Shadi Arafidj. We will also speak to the science behind BMI calculations and have a demonstration of the Biggie Body Condition Scale. Um, so my name is Dr. Shadi Arafidj. I'm a board certified surgeon and this is canine weight management. This is the outline we'll follow here. We'll start off uh, brief with my background, a little introduction to, uh, uh, to weight management issues, some definitions that of course are important and constantly changing, what, what obesity you know, and being overweight does to the body, some weight loss goals, what the diagnostics that are out there um, exactly to that point, what diagnostics are used to measure obesity and being overweight in dogs, comparing those diagnostics, what the, uh, the body has to deal with, with uh, being overweight, individual differences with weight, very uh, popular right now in the medical literature. Some weight loss treatments, which I'm sure everybody's excited about, um, the relationship between people and their dogs when it comes to weight, novel methods of weight loss, a bit more experimental stuff that's out there, how the internet plays a role, uh, some outcomes of, of, of weight loss programs in dogs, and then some future studies and any kind of questions more than happy to take them. So just briefly on me, for those who don't know, I graduated from Cornell University Vet School 2006, did my one-year internship in Boston, so Angel Memorial, and a one-year surgery internship at LIBS, Long Island Veterinary Specialist in Plainview, Long Island, New York, did two of those, and then a three-year residency, became board certified in surgery, moved to Las Vegas, so LVVSC in Nevada, that's where I currently am located. I did that for a little bit, then traveled around the country performing surgery for uh, some time after that, decided to settle down in Silicon Valley at United Vet Specialty and Emergency, um, managed three facilities there, was on call 24-7 for the three facilities, and then uh, became part owner of a hospital in Los Angeles in 2019, and then moved over and launched Vet Triage, a 24-7 virtual teletriage platform for uh, 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 really to try and help increase access to care. And body management, dietary issues are something we commonly deal about deal with at, at vet triage. So, as far as the introduction goes, this is a global problem when it comes to weight management in dogs being overweight or obese. Forty percent um, of dogs in the USA are said to be overweight or obese. Japan, thirty percent. Australia, thirty percent. Canada, depending on the study, up to thirty-eight percent. And so, it's a it's a it's a global problem and it's a progressive problem. It's getting it's getting worse over time. The the broad categories that we use to blame weight management issues in dogs can be broken up into genetics, uh, metabolic or hormonal diseases, nutritional, dietary, and exercise or fitness. And so you can always blame any one of these four, but by far the most common issue we see is a third one, nutritional or dietary issues. The genetic component, you can only have so much control over, especially if you're acquiring a purebred dogs, um, hormonal diseases, metabolic diseases. You know, things like diabetes, for example, or hypothyroidism, these things to some degree you can control, but to some degree you can. And so, you know, that, that plays a, a role in terms of, of, of pathologic reasons why there's weight gain and then a lack of exercise or fitness in, in our dog's lives. But by far, nutritional or dietary is the, the biggest factor. And so when you look at weight management in dogs, you have to define these terms. And just like in people, these terms do change over time. And there is some subject, subjectivity to these, to these terms as well. When you say your dog is, is in ideal shape, or in this case, lean, what does that mean? And so you'll see charts like this, body condition scoring charts, very commonly. Lots of companies put these out, different diagrams. Some are nine-point scale, some are five-point scale. They all have the same intent to try and help the veterinarian, but also the pet owner decide where their, their dog lies in the scale of, of weight. So lean is considered a, a body condition score of five out of a nine point scale, which means somewhere around 15% fat content, um, uh, uh, percent body fat in that dog. Overweight is something over 15% uh, 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 body fat in, in those dogs. And then when you get from, from, from overweight to obese, you're looking at over 30% of, of fat composition or a body condition score of some around eight or nine out of nine. And that's how we try to define these. The same thing with weight loss too. That also kind of depends. So most of the studies that, that, that have been reported are looking for 
a weight loss somewhere around 20% of their current weight. That seems to be kind of the, the goal. That seems to be how you dictate success. But that is that depends. That really depends on the patient. Um, and then, of course, weight loss rate is important. So it's important to, to define these things. And currently, these are the definitions that we're using, but they do change over, over time. So what is what is obesity or being overweight due to the body? Well, it is a systemic disorder. It's it's global in terms of the individual, and it's also considered a chronic inflammatory condition. We have we have found out now that adipose tissue, fat tissue, is actually an active player in this game. It's not just accumulation of fat, but it actually causes inflammation in the body, and so it affects the body from an immune standpoint, inflammation, but also all these different organ functions. So metabolic dysfunction, we already touched upon diabetes mellitus, which is diabetes that we all know about, hypothyroidism, um, kidney disease is, is, is uh, a kid, the kidneys are affected by this, especially when it comes to vascular flow. So perfusion, blood flow to the kidneys, cardiac disease. We know this, of course, in people, if you tend to be carrying too much weight, then you are at a higher risk of having heart disease. We don't see necessarily heart attacks per se in, in dogs, but it does affect certain phases of the heart in dogs, especially the relaxation phase. So di diastole is, the, is, the, is what the name of the phase is. Joint issues, very, very common, very well known in people and in dogs. Of course, the heavier your body is, the more weight your joints have to carry. And that creates this vicious cycle where, well, if you're heavier and your joints hurt, they become arthritic, which makes you not want to move as much. And then that cycle continues. We see the same thing with, with dogs. Liver conditions, pancreatic conditions, overall decline in quality of life and overall decline in longevity. These are the long-term effects of, of obesity. You, you, will, you will shorten a dog's life in, an, in an, a number of years, about two years is usually what's quoted, if they, are, if they are overweight. They will literally lose, again, depending on the study, about two years of their lifespan by being overweight. And you can imagine the same thing with, with that's occurring with, with people. So it's a, a very important multi-systemic, multi-organ condition that also creates a state of inflammation in the body. So with that being said, the solution to weight gain is weight loss. But even that has a lot of, not controversy, but a lot of discussion associated with it. There are, there are nuances to this stuff. Uh, in, the, in the picture here, for example, you've got a large breed dog and a small breed dog. Do you really expect them to lose the same amount of weight over the same amount of time? Probably not. So the general rules is we look for about 20% of weight loss over about a six month period of time. That seems to be a fairly common healthy denominator when you're looking at uh, 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 using a general guideline for weight loss rate in dogs. Um, or others have quoted losing five pounds a month. That of course doesn't make much sense when you're dealing with like, let's say a chihuahua that already weighs 10 pounds. You can't lose five pounds a month. That's not realistic. And so general guidelines like that don't really make sense across the board, but that's been quoted. In the more scientific literature, and this is what your veterinarian and nutritionalists will probably use, are mathematical formulas that that are that are that are targeted towards what your target body weight is, and the formulations are meant to take into account to some degree variation in animal animal sizes. But again, even even the recent literature has has looked at that those formulations and said maybe that those formulas aren't even specific enough or should not be used in a general sense. So the sex of the of the of the dog, the age, the breed, their lifestyle, their own medical history, those things play a role in what medical, what weight loss program you're going to implement for your dog. And that makes sense. We all know this with people too. You, and you can't have a, the same weight loss program for every single person. It just it just would not work. Uh, in that in that way, and the same thing with with dogs too. So, the the to summarize this slide, you need to talk to your veterinarian, plain and simple. They have to take into account the breed, the sex, the age, what their current weight is, what your target weight is, and their prior medical history. Don't self treat your dogs when it comes to weight loss. Talk to a professional. These are all the diagnostics that I was able to find in the medical literature. Some of these are can be used at the home or at the veterinary clinic. Most of these are for laboratory settings only. And when you see a list this long with anything, in the medical field especially, whether you're talking about diagnostics, treatments, or surgical options, when there's this many options, you know we don't have the answer. There is yet to be one consistent measurement of weight and percent body uh, fat in dogs because look at this list. 
it's enormous. And so what's great about what, 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 uh, uh, what Mila is trying to do is figure out a way to make this stuff more scientific, more predictable, more consistent, more applicable. So um, lots of fancy tests, lots of simple tests. None of them really are fitting the bill in all scenarios, but just wanted to give you an idea of what's out there. We're not going to go through these options, obviously, but these are what's out there. Most people will recognize the first one, body weight, obviously using a scale, body condition scoring we've already talked about with charts. So those things are fairly, fairly common, but everything else on there tends to be a bit more specific and out of your reach, really. So, so really what makes sense to talk about is the body condition score, because People have access to this. Veterinary clinics use this a lot. They'll have this in their exam rooms to show a pet owner what the ideal is, where their pet is on that scale. And so when you look at studies that, that ask dog owners, assess the body condition score, about 24% of these owners, their assessment will match the veterinarian's assessment. So a quarter of the time, dog owners are right. So there's a massive misinterpretation. When you give the pet owner, the dog owner, a chart, with a picture on it, that that accuracy for the pet owner goes up to about 50%. So it doubles their accuracy, the accuracy of dog owners assessing their own dog's body condition score, but it's still only 50% accurate when you compare it to the veterinary professional. When you look at veterinary professionals in the studies, only 66% of veterinary facilities, veterinary staff members will actually declare that they are using some sort of body condition scoring. Now, that what they're using varies. Obviously, way more veterinary offices are going to be using scales, and not very many are going to use things that measure like percent body fat or actual um, 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 more like scientific or experimental diagnostic tools, right? But two-thirds, only two-thirds, it should be 100% of veterinary facilities should be assessing the body condition scoring of their patients. So the, the inherent issue with the body condition scoring system is that it's subjective. Even with the professional, the veterinarian who's experienced, who's looked at many, many dogs, hundreds or thousands of dogs over many years of, of clinical practice, it's still subjective. You're still going based on what that veterinarian thinks on the physical exam, on palpation of that pet, and then comparing it to the scale, what, where they think they, they lie. But you have to have a gold standard somewhere. And so the veterinary professionals are going to be your gold standard. Sure, it's subjective, yes, but it's the best you've got. And so when you look at uh, these stats, they're, they're fairly alarming. So just to go into more detail on what happens with the body, and um, the reason why this is so important is because we're going to keep seeing studies on this. It's a very, very popular uh, a point of the, uh, the literature when it comes to, to canines and how obesity affects their body. So for example, diastole, we mentioned that with the cardiac disease, that's the relaxation phase of the heart, of the pumping of the heart, that gets affected. Now, studies have shown that you can reverse those changes if, the, if that obese dog loses weight, so yay to that. Troponin-1 is a hormone that we will measure for becoming more popular as far as a cage side test. So a blood test that looks at muscle damage and we will frequently attribute that muscle damage to heart damage. We equate it that way. And so we do see an elevation of troponin-1 with dogs that have, have a, a, are overweight or obese. Chronic inflammatory state, we've already mentioned that. Bacterial biodiversity, this is a very cool one and, and one that is certainly has taken off. Um, when you look at the intestinal tract, there's a normal population of bacteria, that's the biome. Um, and that you want that population of bacteria to be very heterogeneous. You want it to be diverse. And so we see dogs that are overweight or obese, you start to see more of a homogeneous uh, population of bacteria, and they tend to be like uh, even more evenly spread out. And you kind of don't want that. You want a lot of variety. That's what helps maintain body health. And so when you see things like probiotics, for example, prebiotics, um, these are supplements that are used to try to repopulate the gut. We don't think of it in terms of treating obesity. We think of it more if you have like a stomach upset, you know, then you say probiotics. But it actually, there's a lot of studies on this, on looking at biodiversity in the gut for dogs who have weight gain. Diabetes, a common one. Kidneys, we talk, about, we talk about blood flow to the kidneys, and there was actually was one study that, saw, that, that found there was actually kidney damage when you have weight, weight gain. Orthopedic is obvious. Arthritis is a very common one, and of course, you can shorten their life, lifespan by years. There's actually been a few studies looking at individual differences um, uh, with regards to signalment. So 
sex, age, things like that. So when you look at actually, when you look at sex of dogs that are, that are overweight, the females have it a bit rougher. They have an easier time gaining weight, a harder time losing weight and compared to the males. And so there's some sort of hormonal, hormonal influence there. So be conscientious of that. If you're a female dog owner, the, we, there's a, there's a, always has been a, a common um, um, theory that if you neuter your dog, so you spay or you castrate them, that they're going to be more prone to weight gain. And we, we do see that uh, in intact dogs. So females that are not spayed, males that are not castrated tend to have an easier time losing weight and to have a harder time getting overweight. Now they still can. There's no one factor here. So I just want to stress that. And the pros, the advantages to neutering your pet, to spaying or neuter or, or castrating them outweighs this risk. Okay. But we're just talking specifically from the point of view of weight gain. So when you look at just weight gain and how sex affects it, the neutered animals tend to have a harder time losing weight than the intact ones. Still spay and neuter your pets, still worth it to do, but just be aware that there is a, there is a causality there. Purebred dogs are said to have an easier time losing weight than mixed breed dogs. So there's some sort of genetic influence there. And then the older, the older animals actually seem to be um, easier in terms of uh, uh, losing weight and not gaining weight as easily. So we are seeing, I think also on the human side, the papers are now showing that as you get older, your metabolism doesn't slow down. In fact, it speeds up. And so we're, we, we, I'm, I'm, I'm going to predict that we're starting, we're going to see more studies showing that animals too. We're built a lot from the same stuff. So I think that older animals are going to, we're going to see more studies supporting that older animals have an easier time losing weight. So when you look at weight loss treatments, there's not a one size fits all. That's fairly obvious. And when you look at the different broad categories of what treatments there are, these are basically what you can divide them up into. We'll go into some more experimental stuff, but out of all four of these categories, caloric restriction is number one. The same way that, that calories are the primary driver for obesity in dogs, it's also the primary treatment to resolving this problem is caloric restriction. Dietary intervention is the number one most important thing you can do when it comes to your pet's a, a weight loss program. These other things are very important, but caloric restriction is number one. When you look at veterinary prescription diets, there's a couple of comments to this because this is a point of frustration amongst the veterinary field. Pet owners, dog owners are have poor compliance when it comes to these diets. You can argue that these diets are expensive, right? They are prescriptions. You have to go to the veterinarian and get a, get a prescription and get these diets. Then the diet itself costs more than over-the-counter products on the shelves, right? Um, studies have shown that these prescription diets, a lot of them actually will have uh, mineral deficiencies. When you look at what the, the, what we consider the gold standard, like maintenance diets are. So there are issues there, but the reason why prescription diets are so good is that because there's research backing up their, their use. And so these companies invest a lot of money, a lot of resources, a lot of time, a lot of smart people are go behind these diets to make sure they are considered maintenance diets, safe, and then efficacious. So the point is, talk to your veterinarian before you start uh, calorically restricting your dog's diet. Talk to the veterinarian and see whether or not prescription diet is right for, for your pet and follow their, their advice carefully. Supplements and nutraceuticals are studies looking at certain supplements that when added to, the, to, a, to a diet, specifically a high protein, high fiber diet, which is the hallmark diet we'll use to promote weight loss in dogs. These supplements actually help dogs lose weight. So that's pretty cool there. The physical activity exercise is one that we all are aware of. Um, this turns out to not be as big of a mover when it comes to weight loss in dogs, surprisingly enough. Uh, it is still important. It's important for many reasons, joint mobility, for example, mental stimulation, for example. Some breeds of dog need to be worked. Those high energy hound dogs, Labrador retrievers, um, these dogs need to be worked, herding dogs. Um, but physical activity, although important uh, in the overall sense, may not be playing as big of a role when it comes to weight loss in dogs. And so that's a, that was a surprising finding. Still very good and has to be tailored to your pet. A one-year-old dog is going to be exercised differently than an 18-year-old, you know, geriatric, uh, polyarthritic dog. Right? You have to tailor these things. But uh, that's that's what we're knowing. That's what we know so far when it comes to physical activity. So when you look at studies comparing 
uh, uh, the weight of dogs and their dog owners. Um, we are seeing correlations. There is a positive correlation between obese owner owning an obese dog. There's a risk of being heavier obese. Uh, it's higher in dogs that have that are owned by uh, by overweight or obese people. And when you look at it, there was a study that compared uh, weight loss. So when you look at active weight loss in either a dog plus an owner, meaning they're trying to lose weight together, versus dogs trying to lose weight on their own, meaning the owner doesn't have that goal for themselves, um, it seems that the there is a passive loss in weight to the other to the other individual. So when you do these things together as a pet owner. Um, you intend to lose weight yourself, and you're trying to implement your dog's weight loss program. Apparently, when you work together, it tends to have bigger effect. And even if the, the pet owner didn't have that goal for themselves, it seems to happen anyway if you work helping your dog trying to lose weight. So it's a very cool relationship study that we that we found. And of course, these the the positive outcome to these studies, it's uh, to to the to to this, these weight loss programs. They're amplified when the owner is given tools or guidelines. Obviously, you want to do this with the direction of your veterinarian, so it, it makes sense. And this is the one health approach to this. How do we how do we implement changes that are good for everybody? Experimental uh, methods of weight loss. I'm not necessarily advocating for these. They're very very new items. Uh, gastric electric stimulators have been placed, and what these does it changes the um, the contraction of the stomach, so it, it so the the dog feels satiated, feels full or not as hungry, um, uh, um, in a controlled manner. It's kind of like a pacemaker for for a stomach. Intragastric balloons. If you endoscopically endoscopically place a balloon in the stomach of dogs and you inflate it, the stomach feels full, and so you're not as hungry, right? So there's that as well. Again, these aren't these aren't things that I'm advocating. These are just what's out there in these studies. What was interesting is kibble shape. Apparently, if you have a kibble shape that's cross, um, these dogs will take more time to chew their food. They are less interested in, in eating. They have less zest for, for eating. They finish their food at a slower pace. And apparently, that cross shape uh, promotes weight loss just by changing the shape of the kibble. It, it'll, 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 it'll alter the, uh, the program, the weight loss program for that dog. So that's, that's pretty interesting. And then a medication, um, this is the more mainstream one. It's an appetite suppressant in dogs. I have used this before. I've used it in those severe, severe obese uh, dog cases where not only am I implementing appetite suppression, they also are actually getting daily physical therapy too to try and lose that weight and caloric restriction. And so these are really severe cases. Um, I don't know any veterinarians that use this on, on a regular basis at all. Most vets don't even know about this drug, but but uh, it is a drug that's out there. I have used it before with some success as well. Anyway, so so uh, you you really want to go the more you know natural route, right? Caloric restriction, some physical activity, tailored to your dog by your veterinarian. A study looking at 68 websites found that because of reading levels, these websites had a reading level that was a bit too high. And so that was causing uh, pet owners to not find websites as useful. Also these websites in that study did not really advocate for veterinary follow-up, which is terrible. That's that's a tragedy right there. You, you always have to recommend veterinary follow-up or veterinary guidance. So there's a problem with information on the internet. Surprise, surprise. If you uh, ask pet owners what they use to gauge their weight loss program for dogs, 44% will quote past experience. And only 9% will quote they'll use veterinary guidance for their dog's weight loss program. That's terrible. We have to change that. 95% of dog owners will acknowledge that obesity is a disease, but only 20% believe that you need a professional involved. That's crazy. So then this translates all into outcomes. What is the outcome of weight loss programs in dogs? In a study looking at this, 61% of dogs that were put into a program actually completed it. So a little bit more than half. 8% um, passed away or were euthanized, and another 32% stopped prematurely. What were the reasons for stopping prematurely? The owners couldn't be contacted for the study, so we don't really know. They just stopped. They just didn't want to anymore. Or the dog developed another illness that, or another condition or trauma or something that made it where they were no longer able to finish the program. So a third don't even finish the program. This is under veterinary guidance. Another study looked at um, weight loss programs in dogs, 64%, they were losing weight at an unsatisfactory rate, 44% poor compliance, 
And it just drive the point home that we have to be dedicated to our dog's health the same way you'd be dedicated to your own health. So finally, future studies. Veterinarians have to take charge of this problem. Um, we're all busy. Veterinarians, especially nowadays, have, have decreased access to care. Uh, or, or, or rather, pet owners have decreased access to care because veterinarians are just getting swamped with, with cases, staffing issues, a whole cultural issue. So veterinarians have to take charge of this, though. Uh, this, this is a, a, a preventative measure. It's a prophylactic measure to help, help mitigate future diseases for, for those dogs. We need better accessibility of information for pet owners. We need to have an, a better way of calculating what What's the ideal weight? What weight loss regimen do you want? And then how do you maintain that weight loss after you've achieved it? One Health approach shows promise. Uh, have, have pet owners, um, uh, dog owners and dogs doing this together. And because there's causality there, of course, there's a relationship there. We need more medical publications as we always do to look at more studies on all of these factors. And we need better measuring and monitoring tools. It's not just enough to figure out, okay, is my dog overweight? If so, by how much? If so, what percent loss, what rate, what's my target, and then how do I maintain it? All those things require diagnostics for measuring and monitoring the, the progression. Thank you very much for having me give this talk. I am welcome to any questions, comments, or, uh, or suggestions regarding canine weight loss or anything else you want to talk about. Hi, everyone. Today, I'm going to take you through a demo of the baking body composition scale. The baking scale is not only a scale that measures your pet's weight, but also their body composition and provide you with an overall body score. The first step you'll take in using the baking scale is pressing the on button. Once it's on, it will start to illuminate. And as you start to apply pressure, it will start reading the measurements. Next, you'll open up your mallet app and you'll press on the baby icon. This will allow your scale to sync with your Bluetooth enabled device. Next, you'll invite your pet to sit on the scale, making sure that all four limbs are on there so you have an accurate reading. With your pet sitting on the device, it will start measuring their weight. As you can see here in the app, the weight starts to sink. And once you're done, you'll press save. This will allow the measurement to be saved in the app, and then you can share it with your vet, or you can save it to track changes in your pet's weight. Okay, so thank you, Jamie, for making the video, and thank you, Biggie, for being a really good model there. One of the things that you saw in the on the Biggie scale were four um, circular metal pads. Um, there's actually an impedance mat that we make that sits on top of that, and that looks like this. Uh, and what we're going to be doing uh, starting next year is we actually have uh, a research um, proposals out to a couple of research universities that will be working with us to calibrate the body impedance as it relates to the, the body condition score for the pets. Um, basically what that means is that they are going to put the same pet through a DEXA scan and then for us we're getting the morphometric data as well as the uh, electrical impedance data. So the morphometric data, you, if you've been following along you, or you can revisit one of our earlier podcast hours, we showed the, um, the tape measure that is connected to our software system um, that, can, that is, will be used in addition to the body weight to create um, about, sorry, body weight and the electrical impedance to create a formula for the detection of the body condition score that is backed by the DEXA scan, which is um, the gold standard right now for the body uh, composition. So what Dr. Shadi had just said, um, everything is great because uh, it's, it's about how we can then make it easier for pet parents at home, as well as uh, veterinarians to gather that data. And so the body, the biggie body composition um, scale is a way to do that. Now, how does it actually work? One of the things that we had to find out pretty early on was that the, the limbs of the pets, so unlike humans, the, the body fat that is in the limbs of dogs uh, and cats is actually not fluctuating as much as they do for humans. So what we did was uh, we created a lattice structure um, measurement method. So what that, what that means is that we rotate the power from the impedance pad to turn on and off different segments at different times. This is all covered in our patent. So I just wanna talk about it right now is that at first it gives you the right side impedance, the left side impedance, uh, and then the front side impedance as well as the back side impedance. 
And then it actually does the additional two more measurements, which gives you the cross horizontal, um, as well as the, the right horizontal. And when you do that, you get a, uh, an impedance score, which is measured in ohms, uh, which is you know, the electrical resistance of the body. By taking the, the impedance of several of the limbs cross, uh, cross section at the same time in sequence, allows us to be able to calculate what are the what parts of the signal actually consists of the limbs versus the torso because the the fat um, the body fat is mostly concentrated in the in amongst the torso area that allows us to get a much better uh, impedance score I'm sorry impedance measurement than the uh, than previous impedance scales so that plus the weight is how where we start. But what we do know is that there are also generally uh, differences amongst different breeds. And so through this research over time, we'd like to be able to create tables that are custom tuned to each breed. So rather than a generic table, like the one through nine scale that you know, Royal Canin or Nestle Purina puts out for one to nine body condition scores, we now have a program that's completely tailored to the individual dog. Um, for cats, the formula is actually much easier. Uh, even our preliminary research um, indicates that you only need to take two morphometric measurements in addition to the weight, which is the, um, the lower pelvic circumference as well as the torso circumference uh, in addition to the weight and, and come up with a pretty good body condition score. And that's because cats are mostly domestic short hairs of unknown parentage. And so there's not as much difference individually between the, amongst pets versus the, the more greater variability when it comes to different breeds of dogs. So that's actually something that's very interesting. Now here's something that uh, more of a little bit of a bonus is last, uh, you know, in, in August, we kind of talked, we started talking about how we would also for clinics that don't buy our scale that have already invested in the floor scale, we would be building a camera system that allows them to Point them, to point it to the to the actual digital scale that they already have, and turn any scale into a smart scale. Well, now I'm pleased to announce that I'm just kidding. That's a that's a screenshot of the League of Legends. It's it's a video game that uh, some finance guy decided to play while he was making presentation. Anyway, so the, <laughs> that was a joke. Uh, anyway, so we actually have this camera system that we created that allows you to take the to point it to a scale and then be able to take the weight. So, uh, so now I actually have a demo video put together by our developers showing this exact thing. So I'm just gonna jump forward a little bit and you'll see that it's a wireless camera that's connected to the, our, our mobile app. And so right now it's pointing to the ceiling, which is why you only see the ceiling tiles. And the next thing that happens is you point the camera to a scale and you can see the reading of the scale on our, mobile, our, uh, our app. And it interprets the scale reading and it tells you it's 1.3 or 4 pounds. So we have already achieved this uh, in the time that we've been giving these office hours. And this is the culmination of this project. So in the future, if you are a veterinarian and you already have a practice that already has spent thousands of dollars on a scale, you don't need to get rid of that scale. You don't need to buy a, a, you know, a replacement uh, scale from us. You just need to turn, you know, buy a camera here that's going to be able to take that measurement and then send it to the cloud into our system, just as if you were using it um, on an, in another, um, you know, just as if you, it was a digital scale to begin with. So this abridges the connection between the analog world and the digital world. So something we're very excited about that we told you we would build and, and now it's here. Thank you for watching this edition of Mel Up Office Hours. Don't forget to catch us live on the second Tuesday of every month at 1 p.m. Central or watch the rest of the recordings at www.mela.ai webinars.